It seems like every year I'm making a new crosscut sled and this year is no exception. This is an evolution of the existing designs I've used uh, and well, it's really the best that I've made so far. All the hardware is provided by Timbicon and there will be two hardware packages available depending on what sort of configuration you want from Timbicon and the plans are freely available. If we take a bit of a closer look, we've got replaceable zero clearance inserts made out of six millimeter MDF. You can replace the insert for angled cuts, wider blades, or even dado blades. Same goes for the back zero clearance insert, though this is a dovetailed one, so it just drops down nice and easily. We've got an auxiliary fence so that you can do angled cuts, add a little stop block in there. You can also throw a clamp onto the T-track or in these routed grooves. You can also put the clamp down there to hold small parts. Finally, we've got this flip stop here. This is repeatable to one millimeter thanks to some Inco racks on the back. And in the future, I'll be making a micro adjust feature so that it can get sub millimeter accuracy. So let me show you how I made it. The Wood Knight is sponsored by I Would Like. This is an 18 mil piece of plywood, one meter wide by 650 mil deep. Found for most things that we do in this workshop, this is a good size. This line here is the leftmost part of our table saw blade, and this is the rightmost part of what would be a standard width blade, so eighth inch or 3.25 millimeters. So this would make up our kerf line here, and everything is basically referenced off this line. I have a left tilting arbor table saw, so I'm putting the majority of my crosscut sled on that side and having it asymmetrical. The reason for that is less so to do with personal preference, but as I said, this is a left tilting out of sort. So this line here stays pretty fixed, whether it's a dado stack or a thin curved blade, it never exceeds, when it's at 90, exceeds that point there. However, it does cross over to here when it's a wider blade. So this means that if I change between two different blades, maybe I've upgraded my blade or whatever, Realistically, I don't have to change the insert that will go on this side, just the insert that goes on this side. That sounds a little bit complicated, but we'll go over that a little bit later again. So we've got some marks for where things are going to go, where things are going to be removed, and what will be called our no-go zone. So I'll try and go over some of these lines. As I said, these are all in the plan, so if this is a little bit too fast or confusing, go download the plans and you'll kind of see what I mean. These two lines here represent the space where the runners are going to go. Uh, either side of those runners, we've got these four channels here. And these will be for these T-track bolts. These are to hold down the auxiliary fences or even for hold downs that use this T-track bolt. So it's a half inch wide head uh, with a five sixteenth inch bolt. So we need to make two cuts. This actually needs to go on the other side but it's kind of easier if we <laughs> draw it all out on one side, at least to start off with. So these bolts will have an enlarged, or these slots will have an enlarged hole at one end, so you can slide it in and then they'll be captured in there. The insert for the zero clearance will be on both sides of the blade and that'll make up from here to here. That's a 100 mil wide insert. Now that covers a lot of different scenarios. So whether we've got a thin curve blade in or to here, which is where the maximum size for the dado stack on my table saw goes to 45 degrees. So that's why we've got the no-go zone on this side as well. That has to extend far enough that we can include some T-nuts and some cap screws. So as you can see, that works fine. Uh, a clearer view will be this page of the plans. Uh, we've got this big cutout here for the dado blades, the thinner cutout for a standard table saw blade, and then the angled cutout that shows there that in theory, uh, that actually won't contact metal, so it'll be all nice and safe. So the first thing to do to the base here is to cut these grooves. For that, you're gonna need two router bits, a half inch bit and a 5 16 inch bit. Using a straight edge clamp to the workpiece, I started with a half inch spiral upcut bit for a groove that was just barely deeper than the thickness of the bolt head. Spiral upcut bits going across the grain like this isn't the greatest idea because it will tear the fibers out. This resulted in the router getting stuck and you can see me run off to get a piece of sandpaper to clean it up so I could continue. One end of the groove gets a half inch cut all the way through to allow the bolts to slide in. 
Then I could move to the 5 16th inch cutter. A good rule of thumb is to plunge no more than half the diameter of the bit per pass, which works out to be about 4 millimeters. Using the turret stopper was pretty easy to batch that out. Now is the best time to sand the underside with some 180 grit, just to get it silky smooth so it glides better. In the deluxe package, there are two aluminium miter bars. In the standard package, you'll have to make your own wooden runners and I'll cover that in a moment. So these are stupid simple to use. These are a block of aluminium, three mounting holes, and four nylon bolts in them. So the nylon bolts let you dial it in for the perfect fit for your table saw. I've dialed this one in and it's bang on perfect. Uh, these miter bars come with mounting screws as well. So you just need a Phillips head screwdriver to adjust those. See out of, the, out of the package there's a bit of play in there but that can be adjusted quite easily. To temporarily attach the miter bars to the underside of the sled I'm just using some double sided tape. I've elevated the miter bars ever so slightly by putting some small washers underneath them. Using the fence as a guide for placement, I place the sled base straight onto the runners and push down to engage the tape. After it was flipped, I used a self-centering bit, also known as a VIX bit, to drill and drive the screws properly to secure the runners. This was pretty straightforward, just nibbling away half an inch at a time. After the groove was cut, I used a 19mm Forstner bit to counterbore for some T-nuts. I haven't been able to find any low-profile M6 threaded inserts, so T-nuts are ears. These will hold the zero clearance inserts down. Both the front and back fences are made up of two pieces of 18mm plywood laminated together. I made both pieces oversized so there was enough to cut off to make sure everything was square. After it was dried, the front fence was jointed just to get it as square as possible. In plywood this doesn't leave a particularly smooth finish so both sides were smoothed up at the table saw. For this sled, the front fence gets three dados, one for the T-track, one for the incorrect position of racks, and a final very shallow dado on top for the scales. For the zero clearance insert in the fence, a groove needs to be cut out with a dovetail so the insert can slide in and out. A better idea would have probably been to laminate a layer of MDF with a dovetail pre-cut, but I wasn't thinking straight. I used my trusty half inch spiral upcut bit with a guide bushing up against a scrap of MDF that I used as a fence to hog out the majority of the material. I then came back with a 14 degree dovetail bit. This worked out surprisingly great, though it would have been much easier if I had a cross cut slide. The insert was cut at the table saw by tilting the blade to 14 degrees. Four of the Inca racks are installed on the back with just two screws each. The fifth rack goes on the stop block. The spacing between them just needs to be slightly less than the length of the rack piece. I use the fifth piece to position them so that they meshed correctly. The back fence isn't anything particularly fancy. It receives some curves to make it look nicer but also to reduce the weight. Just leave about 100mm either side of the blade for extra strength. Like the front fence, the auxiliary fences receive a dado to receive aluminium T-track. 
These fences will be secured in the routed grooves in the base, so they need a slot for the bolts to go through. I made a start and end hole using an 8mm bread point. Then over at the router table I could connect the two holes with the 5 16 inch router bit. This took four passes flipping each pass. Using start and stop holes makes it much safer than just plunging at the router table and since I was flipping the piece with each pass the router bit was never exposed through the plywood. The T-Track needed some mounting holes so a small drill bit to drill for the number 6 screws then a larger bit to countersink. Trimming off the corners of the T-Track and auxiliary fence at the same time makes it a perfect fit and it allows the auxiliary fence to get further back towards the main fence. To attach the front fence I first carefully cut a kerf almost all the way down the sled. This lets me put in a steel ruler in the kerf and my larger square to roughly align the fence. Then I slide this sled back enough to clamp it into position and drive two screws in, one at either end. Then I can perform the five cut technique. You get a large panel cutting off slightly more than the kerf from one side. Rotate it clockwise so that the cut side is up against the fence and continue until you've rotated back to the original side. Then you can cut off a wider piece, about 25mm or so. Then making note of the orientation of the piece, measure the front and back, then subtract the back measurement from the front. This value is the error accumulated over the four sides, so divide by four and you've got how far you are actually out. In hindsight, don't do this test with packing grade plywood that splinters if you look at it funny. MDF is a much better choice. Then, depending on which way you're out, you can clamp a block to the sled, push it up against the fence, undo one screw, insert a filler gauge for the distance that you're out, drill a new hole and secure it again. Repeat the test until you're satisfied. Then you can secure the fence with at least two extra screws per side. To provide repeatability, a stop block is needed. Plan details all the sizes for the stop block pieces, but it'll basically consist of two L blocks. One piece receives a rabbit for the remaining inquiry rack piece. The rack can be installed with two small screws. The actual stop block part of this block is hinged, so using the crosscut sled you can make a pretty rudimentary hinge. It's basically just a single box joint. While it isn't pretty, it has zero play, unlike most metal hinges. A dado stack would have been quicker to cut, but taken longer overall to set up the one block. At the drill press, the two pieces are slotted together then drilled all the way through for the pin. So that the hinges can well hinge, I sanded the parts round. A round over or bull nose bit would have worked too, but this was quick enough. The remaining parts all get drilled for the T-bolts to fit through and into. Then it could be glued up in position. I used some CA glue and wood glue. The CA acts as a clamp while the wood glue provides the actual strength. Then the scales could be installed just measuring from the kerf to the stop block. The shallow groove provides a suitable friction fit for the scales to be retained. However, you could add a drop of CA or some double sided tape to secure it in the groove. So as I said, this is in partnership with Timbercon. So they've got two hardware packages available, a standard and deluxe. If you head over to the link in the description below, you'll see what is entailed in both of them. Basically all you need in addition to one of those is plywood, some MDF or six millimeter plywood if that's what you want to use, uh, the T-nuts and the cap screws. Uh, additionally, I've used a M8 bolt here. These were just what I already had on hand. So if you've got similar sort of hardware, um, use that instead for those parts. The plans for this are freely available from Timbercon's website. You don't actually need to buy the hardware kits. So head over to there if you want to build one of these very versatile crosscut sleds. Thanks for watching.